My name is Dina Hayden. I'm the director of Co-Creative Center and welcome to Co-Creative Sessions. Uh, Co-Creative Sessions is a series of workshops and training sessions geared to enrich, educate, and connect creatives throughout New Bedford. This program is funded by Mass Development, TDI, and the Bar Foundation and is a component of a broader TDI Creative Cities initiative to boost the arts-based econ economic development here in New Bedford. Um, today we have a film panel discussion um, and joining us are our panelists, uh, Lindsay Meesh, a co-producer of Vessel, executive director of DATMA, Ian Cheney, director of The Long Coast, Drew Fittardo, uh, director of Restart, and our discussions moderated by Lori Zaflack. Um, and again, if you have any questions, just add them to the Q&A. And at the end of the presentation, we'll open up for questions. And I will hand it off to Lori. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, and welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're with us this evening. Um, so why bring these three, three creatives together? Um, each of their projects is compelling in its own right. Um, and each gives us a glimpse into the different facets of the New England commercial seafood industry and asks us to think about how that industry shapes the livelihoods of individuals working within it, as well as others who are part of the larger communities in which these industries are located, including and perhaps especially creatives. So tonight we're going to go through a set of questions and um, as Dina mentioned, if you have questions, please feel free to add them. We might get to some of them right away and then um, after a bit of, of conversation, we'll look back at the Q&A and see if there are any that we've missed. Um, so just starting off, I imagine that there are some very different whys behind your projects. Um, if we can ask, what motivated you to make the film that you made that you're going to be speaking about tonight? And what did you want to accomplish with it? Those are kind of two big questions. But Ian, if we can start with you. Um, and also just to mention, I think, I think you all know, um, Drew, or many of you know Drew and Lindsay, that Ian is from Camden, Maine. So we're glad to, to have him um, as a part of the New Bedford creative community uh, with us this evening. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here in in New Bedford, virtually. <laughs> um, um, sure. Uh, uh, my goal uh, with the Long Coast was was a shared goal with, with um, uh, my friend Robin Metcalf, who, who produced the film. We we got to talking about the idea of working together. Robin's a a writer and, and historian and wears a lot of other hats as well. And, and, and the two of us realized we lived a long time or spent a lot of time along the, the coast of Maine without knowing much about um, seafood production along the coast of Maine. And so we took what was what was for us felt like an unusual step, which was to, to kind of enter a space without an agenda or a thesis. Um, but go in with sort of open minds and open eyes and cameras rolling and try to see uh, see the the ecosystems of of seafood production along the main coast and learn what we could and reflect that back to an audience. So we started with a pretty uh, you know with a pretty vague <laughs> uh, launching point and decided to do this you know, independently on a, on a, on a, you know, relatively small budget and, and, and therefore weren't beholden to sort of fit the film into any particular box. I don't, I don't know of a, and that's mostly how I work anyway. So it wasn't much of a sh shift, but I think, you know, for folks in, uh, you know, kind of professional TV production or, or something like that, you know, you probably couldn't go in, you know, have the luxury of, of entering a space that way for a film. Um, it was, I don't know, more the way a, a poet might enter a space, you know, like let's, 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 let's find the, the stories and the beauty and the rhymes of, of, of these places and see how they fit together and see how they affect us and share them again with an audience. So, so, so that, that, um, 
if you've taken a peek at the film, I, I hope that that is part of what comes across, not so much the declaration of an agenda or the hammering home of a thesis, but a but an invitation into a, into a space with, with, with the audience. Maybe that sounds sort of pretentious, but that's that that was kind of our idea. Uh, so that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, no, I think it's it's such an immersive um, experience in that way. And, and I, I've got many more questions <laughs> for you. Um, Lindsay, your, I know your film had had a very kind of different intent. Um, Vessels is, is a mini doc, and it was made after the public art installation of Vessels took place. So can you kind of talk about when you all decided that you would make a film um, within the process of conceptualizing the public art and really what you set out to do with the mini doc? Sure, sure. Uh, one of the goals of DATMA is to try to use the city as a gallery and um, kind of highlight these spaces that already exist. The, so for us, uh, you know, walking around the downtown area in particular, and we're a fairly new organization, uh, there seems to have been this like stopping point where when you get down to the very bottom of Union Street, it didn't feel as accessible for pedestrians to access the waterfront. Also, I thought that um, because I'm not originally from New Bedford, I'm, I'm from um, Rochester, New York on Lake Ontario. And the, for, for me, the day-to-day the -day of involving um, just having access to the water was just um, just part of your every day. And it's, it baffled me as someone that moved here that so many people would, even people that worked in downtown would never go to the waterfront. And it seemed so precious to me. And like um, Ian and Robin's film, I felt like I wanted to have an opportunity to give a front row seat to this like really precious, important, like cornerstone of the city. Uh, what the city was and what it will be tomorrow. I mean, the fishing industry has always been there. And so I just assume it's going to be, you know, part of the city's economy forever. Um, it'll just evolve and, and what, that, what that looks like um, as um, Ian Robbins films talking about how that fishing industry is evolving. But, um, you know, with, with presenting it, I wasn't sure our artists were going to be, we're going to take the courageous path of uh, working with, uh, meeting a lot of new people. I mean, it's a very protected, sacred space in a way uh, where you have to know the right people to be able to even get, talk to a fisherman, get on a boat. And um, thankfully we spent the time to make the right relationships to be able to make that happen and take the footage. Um, then uh, COVID, and then we had a pandemic. And it occurred to us that um, the technology that we, we were using, which were ultimately projections, um, these pieces of art that were projected on buildings and you heard sound from boats and um, it was this entire experience. It, it occurred to us that that technology allowed us to move forward during a pandemic and make art accessible at a time when people couldn't enter into, into buildings. Um, however, what wasn't accessible was that um, you could only view these projections at night. And then also our projections were temporary. We, we could only um, have the capacity to show them for eight weeks. So there was this, we were in this dilemma of wanting to be able to continue to tell our story. And we're in that dilemma a lot because we um, focus on temporary artwork. So archiving our work is very important, keeping a record, trying to explain to people the type of projects that we do. And we're especially being new, we're still in a way figuring out our identity. Um, sometimes showing people what we can do is all we've got and we only have a short season to be able to do that. So um, I will say we were working with the right artists at the right time. So with them recording the footage to create their, what I was calling like digital murals, which I know the artists would probably cringe. Um, they, they, the footage just kind of naturally turned into a documentary and there was just so much more depth to the individual stories and also the response from the community about having artwork up during a pandemic. So we wanted to be able to have a place to share those sound bites um, 
it, because they were really important and it mattered to have something to continue and something that was new and something that wasn't closed. So that's um, how we ended up uh, deciding that we wanted to co-produce the documentary, which I, I'm not sure where it would have been. I'm sure it would have happened eventually, but we certainly felt like we were part of it and um, uh, you know, worked with the artists and shared our opinion and maybe it made a difference. But um, we, what mattered to us is even that we were able to um, continue the livelihood of an artist during a pandemic when artists were suffering the most, uh, not the most, uh, mm, zip, uh, when <laughs> artists had really little work because everything was closed and no one, no one was buying anything. So anyway, so that's my long answer about that. Yeah, no, that's, that's super insightful. And it's, it's interesting. It's such a natural segue, um, Drew, to your work um, to restart 2020 because the film so beautifully captures some of this. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen the film yet or, or any of these films, um, I absolutely encourage you to see them um, when you get a chance. And, um, and Drew, I was, I was fascinated by how you started a story and really kind of took us through some of the longer history of where New Bedford has been and the changes it's seen, but then really took us tightly to a specific moment or period of the pandemic and what people were were experiencing um yeah so can you tell us kind of one where this idea how did this idea come about i imagine in some ways a lot of creative said we should be doc documenting what's taking place here but you did it <laughs> in the way with the film <laughs> yeah so it, actually the the start of this film is uh thanks to Lindsay and and uh silver currents of 2019 because I was in, I was at the New Bedford Folk Festival. I had a tent and I was selling some um, posters that I had made. And we're underneath this beautiful um, sky net. And then this guy from Montana comes up to me and he's like, hey, where do I go get something to eat? And I said, I said, oh, you know, go to No Props. The burrito place is awesome. Then he came back and he's like, yo, that's awesome. But where, how did this happen? Like, how did this place become <laughs> this art place? And I was like, I honestly don't know. Um, I don't know. And I'm, I'm like, He's like, someone's got to tell that story. And I was like, yeah, someone should tell that story. <laughs> and then at the same time, my student, uh, who's actually here right now, Alyssa uh, Patella, was, um, she had a screening for a film that she made, Junkie. And she inspired me to like do something um, for an audience. And then um, you have my own screening. And um, it was like a perfect storm because I realized the story wasn't being told. And there's a media you know, avoid in the South Coast where people from Boston don't want to come to the city and Providence, it, the, the stations in Providence only come down when a building's on fire. Um, so how do you get the story out? And I decided to just take, just do it and, and, um, and, and be the change I want to see in this world. So that's how I, uh, I, I made this film. <laughs> and then the pandemic happened and I was like, what do we do? And it was like, uh, I think we got to keep telling this story. Um, and if all the artists die, well then, Hopefully that doesn't happen on uh, this story, but but thankfully, thankfully, um, the the pandemic was was not as as, as severe as 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 we had feared. So it worked out. Yeah, um, and it was it was interesting, Ian. I know that you and Robin filmed, started filming, or, or actually, help us out. Did you, you started filming before the pandemic started? That's right. Officially, That's right. And you finished the prod. You finished. Well, and then what happened? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. We um, we foolishly started filming in in September, which is sort of almost almost winter, um, and uh, and and filmed through the winter. You know, just so looking forward to 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 the summer. You know, that would be our time to to really dig into the film and. And enjoy Maine and uh, on the on the water and yeah the March whenever it was mid March things sort of shut down so the 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 crew basically <laughs> was reduced to to me um, and so I went out as best I could through March April and May um, f filming you know the Elver harvest these tiny glass eels that. Are, are like sold at two thousand dollars a pound and harvested at a very particular time of year when the eels are running upstream um and and a few other 
uh, you know, half dozen other shoots, and then and then went into editing, which was which was fine during a during a pandemic, and and then we premiered the film in, in September of that year. Anyway, but so so we um, we decided not to really lean into the pandemic too too much in the film. There's sort of a coda in the film, which is kind of a nod to the to the idea. I think that for for people who work on the sea. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of like one dang thing after another in a way. Um, and so there's a there's a spirit of, of resilience and adaptation mm -hmm. that that just runs like a you know like a tradition through um, through the families we spent time with. So in the last scene, it reminded me of like that I, it reminded me that I, I think I bought maybe 50 to 100 pounds of scallops this past year. I don't even like scallops. You hear the <laughs> way that I say scallops, you can tell I'm not from here. And it was just like the guy, you know, putting the, the cup through the window so then he didn't get near the people to take the cash to then give them the lobsters to the window. It's like, oh my God, it was, it, you didn't have to say much. It was, right. it showed the resilience and I think one thing that I find so beautiful about that um, resilience is that that grit that is in every um, it was that it, that exists in all of the eyes and, and souls of anybody that works on the water is just um, it's something that really inspired us to go forward with an exhibition we have this summer of of um, women in the fishing industry. It's just like the same like just resilience. It's beautiful and um, I w as heartbroken as I was. Um, to see that last scene, it also gave me a lot of, it was very empowering. It was, it was a very weird dichot dichotomy, but one that was very similar. Just change it from lobsters to scallops, and then that was New Bedford. So there was a lot of overlap with that. Right. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I, I think that's right. There's, um, I, I even toyed with the idea of not seeing the lobsters there. Um, so you could sort of map onto those fishermen anything you know up and down the the sea coast um, but uh but in the end, you know, had to end with some pictures of lobsters. It's a movie about maine <laughs> <laughs> and and so I think that brings up the question about you know filming is so interesting, thinking about filming and showing imagery of of maritime culture and places coastal communities and and you know that to do it in a way that is um, that is unique and with a particular view. And I think that all three of the films, to me, um, I, t I told Drew earlier, I said, I felt like you made that film for me. <laughs> um, and I feel that way actually about, about all three of the films as a viewer. I was so, um, so became so quickly kind of interested in the characters in your films and connected to them, but also connected to the places that that you show and you know and you know with vessels the the impact of the work um and uh so thinking about making films in coastal communities with fishermen but also with creatives can you all talk a little bit about your process of like that whole trust building and just spending time with people to get them on film and get them to open up drew maybe maybe you can start with that <laughs> um yeah i mean uh, my, my strategy is uh it's pretty straightforward. Um, I, I like to focus on the person first and then worry about um, the cameras and everything. So I travel light, just one camera, no lights, um, you know, not even a hard wire microphone. But um, and then I like to sometimes set up the camera in the corner and then just talk to people and then then they forget it's there. <laughs> um, but like a lot of the stuff, like I, it was trying to pitch this idea to people ahead of time. I remember I think Lindsay and I had like an hour long conversation before I even showed up with a camera and it was like, Hey, I want to do this thing. And here's why I want, I think, you know, you're awesome fit for it. And um, so for me, it was just reaching out to people and, and just genuinely caring about what they're going through. And, um, and then everything else came, came secondary. I think for, that was like my strategy. Same. We had a lot of conversations earlier on. We had to prove that we weren't like a anti-fishing group and that we weren't going to ask for money. And so we were like, okay, well, 
we're, we're oh, got it. We know the code. And, and then um, we made some friends with people who um, introduced us. And um, what was most important was that we were talking about the contemporary fishing industry mm -hmm. um, and showing light on that. And then I think what was even more important than that is our piece wasn't about the fishermen. It was about their boats. And so it was so much easier to jump into a conversation because as um, you know, the, the artist would say is like, we just called and we said, we don't want to interview you. We want to interview your boat. And then suddenly <laughs> the voice tone changed and they were like, come on, let's go for a ride. And they were like being tasked like pounds of fish as a thank you. And it just had like a totally different vibe. And um, uh, you know, there's the fishing industry has a history and, and we're like, you know, hit in the head with that time and time and again, but what is not told is like this moment in time now, or maybe what's going to happen tomorrow. And I think that's really interesting and, and a way for us to all connect. And, and it's, it's not all about going in and killing a whale anymore. So, but for some reason, like yeah. a lot of people haven't gotten that memo. Yes. So yeah. it's just like, this is something that is happening now. And as I said earlier, is a cornerstone and we want to celebrate that and just create awareness and, and celebrate this. So just come at things with a positive attitude and uh, just try to be thankful for people's time. But um, yeah, it, I don't suggest coming out of the camera right away unless you already um, are friends with everybody and have gained that trust. I don't know. I mean, we, we didn't know anybody. Um, I don't know if uh, Ian and Robin were able to, because you had a, quite a cast of characters, a really wide range of different people in the industry. And it was, it was one of my questions too about um, you know, the culture in Maine or maybe because you've been living in Camden for a while, if you already had a lot of those relationships. No, I, I, I would say we had, we had, um, we had, we had some difficulty, uh, actually. Um, I think our the, the relationships we were able to forge, yeah, did did begin with some of our, our producers and our, our team just reaching out and and it was a hard film for them to describe because it was like, well, what's your film about? And it's like, well, it's about seafood. It's like, what's your agenda? Like, no agenda, you know. It was like we kind of it sounded like we were lying. Um, even though authentically we were like, well, we actually really just want to come see your space and hear your story and that's sort of it. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, to their credit, a good number of people were, you know, got on board with that and, and liked the idea of, of, of sharing their story, you know, full stop. Um, and almost like I, half of them women. I couldn't believe all the women that were captains and like had their own boats or their own like companies like the eel company i was like what it was it was great to see so many women in leadership roles in your film yeah we we, we did have we didn't we didn't specifically you know set out with a kind of uh you know vision of how many women and how many men or you know to like check boxes or anything but we did set out with a goal of, of, of trying to, from a very general standpoint, kind of avoid some of the, I don't know, just some of the stereotypes of, of how we tend to depict the main coast. And some of that for me was mostly about avoiding anything that felt too much like a postcard. Um, and that's, it's kind of hard. Like there's still parts of the film where it's like, ah, oh, it just sort of looks like a postcard, um, you know, a, a harbor with, with the with the lobster boat coming through it, it's like hard to not make that look nice. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I think part of it was yeah the, the people we were drawn to. Let's let's try to include some voices who, you know, aren't aren't the stereotypical voices. There's there's you know the, the difficulties we had were, were 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 probably pretty predictable. Looking back on it now, you know, main. Uh, it's, it's pretty torn up about the controversy over um, right whales and and lobster fishing lines, and so and there have been films that are, um, you know, t basically vilifying the the lobster industry. So and you know and there are always filmmakers who are out to get you, um, and they you know they kind of make it hard for people who are not necessarily out to get anyone. Um, but I've made films that that raise you know in the past that raise questions about like American agriculture and the status quo and stuff like that. So I think we had some trouble you know 
they would Google our names or something. Oh, these guys are probably making an anti-whale or, you know, anti-lobster film or anti or whatever, whatever it may be. So, um, so yeah, it wasn't, it, uh, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, as, as artists and journalists and filmmakers, however you define a, a documentary filmmaker, <laughs> kind of depends on the day, um, you know, it, our experience out there and, and our ability to earn people's trust is affected by our peers and, and, and what they do and how they conduct themselves. So, um, so it's, I don't know where to go with that, but it's important to kind of keep that in view. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of remembering at the end of the day, like, it wasn't our fault that we didn't get access to that place because, you know, yeah. here's, here's what people expect from the media. So how do we work with that? Yeah, yeah I think um, all of your films, there's <clears throat> probably so many questions we could ask about editing, you know, about how as a creative do you, um, and, and particularly making documentary films work with what you get. Um, and, uh, and I am curious and also thinking about editing during the pandemic, Ian, as you mentioned, um, but, but given kind of the strategies of your, your filmmaking, I, I guess, approach, um, Drew, maybe you could speak to ev even just how much time has it taken you to edit your film? <laughs> And how has that happened? And how have how were there any aha moments where you really started to find particular structure that then helped you see how it was going to come together? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure similar to Ian. I don't know what his process was, but for for me, uh, I was still shooting the film while I was editing it, and um, I found that as I was shooting things and as I was gathering new things, I was like, oh, I have to change this edit because now the story is different or. Why not? I, I think for me, I think I had to focus on identifying three characters and then constructing a beginning, middle, and end for all three of them that united around some central theme. So that for me, that was what I was trying to do um, in the editing process. And and it's we started. Um, I want to say I started editing sometime in like early March of 2020, right when the pandemic started. Um, I, I, I had shot some stuff in February, so I was like starting to go through and edit stuff in, in March. And then, then once the pandemic started, you know, lifting and, and then people started doing more things, I started shooting more things and then probably got really serious into the editing, maybe like July to like maybe January is, is so it, it was definitely a process. We had um, 19 hours worth of footage and had over like 1700 clips to go through. So it was definitely a, a process. <laughs> Lindsay, um, since you all, you know, were working and, and Mazari was working with footage that they had already built essentially, but you still had to create the story, you know, just cause you have the footage, you know, to, to Drew's point does, you know, doesn't mean you have the story. Um, uh, and I, you know, I, I think it's interesting how you all open the film in particular and some of the messaging that comes out really early on. I think, you know, for us, we tried to, um, it was really important for us to use that moment in time to allow artists to have their creative freedom. And, uh, you know, what we, backing it up to when we first started having a conversation with them, um, we even came to like a legal agreement that they were not allowed to talk about the fishing industry or New Bedford in a negative way. Hmm. Like they had to, like, otherwise we wouldn't approve and we wouldn't stand by it. So with that, if they were to, to um, fulfill our own perspectives, they could choose the path that they wanted to do that. Interesting. Um, and so yeah. there, there was a lot of freedom there, which sometimes was complicated if you're trying to give a report to a board and you're trying to give a project update on art and creativity and the process of, of that somehow. And, you know, you have to like sh show a presentation, but still at the same time, uh, ask people to use their imagination. Maybe they, I don't know, it's, it, there was a lot of trust and, um, for an organization, we're still trying to figure out each time we do a project, like what is it that we absolutely want out of it? 
and then um, how much room are we going to give the creatives? So, um, and I'm an artist myself, so I try to be sensitive about giving people my impression about like, oh, wouldn't you, don't you think you should add a little bit more orange there? And that's actually something that one of my board members wanted. She wanted more orange there. And it was just, it's not, um, sometimes you just had to allow an artist to do what they wanted to do. So I, it, you know, as long as the messaging came out the way that they wanted it, that we wanted it, that's, that was the important. So as far as the visual part, um, we can take no credit for that, except that we approved it and we stamped it in the end. Um, and we felt like we were, it was something that we were proud of and we wanted to be associated with. So we were, it was, it was a good experience, but it's, it's stressful to work with people when you're not the one with the paintbrush, you know, it's, it's very stressful. <laughs> um, but you know, as long as again, you create those guidelines at the beginning and, um, it's just like any sort of commission or asking someone to come to your house and do something for you, like paint a wall, like there, you uh, what you say is not always what the person is thinking, um, but as long as in the end it's blue, <laughs> that's kind of all that matters, you know, or as long as, as long as they like keep the paint in the living room, that's important. So you just have to come up with your checklist of, of wants and then try to allow for collaboration and interpretation. So sorry, it's like... No, no, I think, no, I think that's a fascinating answer and it also speaks to making films for specific purposes or making films for your, the difference, you know, between if you're making a film, I'm gonna say for your own purposes and as an artist or creative, if you have a story you wanna tell, and yet, and, and Drew, you can probably speak to this and Ian too, you still have to find the audience for your film. You know, it still is about that of having your film, your story being heard and seen, so connecting. Um, and um, yeah, so maybe, yeah, I think it'd be fun to chat a little bit about the actual process of getting the film out into the world um, and the decisions you all have made about how to do that and particularly also how to do that under the conditions of, of the pandemic. Um, and, and Drew, uh, you want to go through kind of how your film has gotten out into the, the world? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's still, well, it's still, it's still on a journey. <laughs> um, I did actually, right before I, well, I did, I did get an email from a film festival that said that, um, that it was, the film was selected to be part of the film festival. I can't actually broadcast it because it's still embargoed, but um, awesome. some exciting news to be like, okay, someone cares about this place and wants to see the film. But um, for me, I I realized I had to do this all by myself. Like, um, there were people within this community who were like, yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna be successful in this project. You're gonna you are gonna fail if you're not connected to a nonprofit. You're not gonna you're not gonna do this. Um, and I said, okay, well, great, thanks. And I went on and I, well, for me, the biggest thing was that I had a Kickstarter campaign mm -hmm. um, and I was able to build a coalition of people that were able to help me um, fund this film and make it happen. So part of the Kickstarter was that we had, we, I was able to develop a, um, a virtual screening, um, which was great. I was inspired by the folks at uh, the Community Foundation who had a, a summer blast last, last year and they had this big uh, virtual thing and I shot something for Datma and gave it to them and then I, they gave me like a link and I was able to watch the whole thing. I was like, this is this is awesome. I want to do this for, for my film. So we were able to get like about 150 people to watch the film from uh, their comfort of their own home. And then um, as film festivals kind of deteriorated during the pandemic, I was like, we got to find another way to get it out there. So um, that was awesome. And then we were, I was able to share it with about 120 um, high schoolers for the students of mind. So um, they needed the perspective of New Bedford because <laughs> they, uh, you know, just living across the river, they have a much different view of the city than I do. <laughs> and so it's still an ongoing process. <laughs> yeah, well, and yeah, and I think that that's probably a lesson for, I'd say for um, all the creatives, you know, in, in this conversation, it's, it's a question, you know, how do I get my work seen? and what what works and like what resonates and is it about building relationships or finding new technology or just taking more risks um and ian since this is now your 10th film i believe that and with the 11th and the 12th also in the process of or underway is that right the long coast is the 10th is that yeah so you've done this a few times <laughs> um 
Yeah. Well, I, 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 I don't know. I, 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 probably not the best judge, but I, 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 I don't know. I don't know that I've gotten any better at it for it being the tenth time. Um, yeah. And that's that's partly a, a way of saying something really obvious, which is that every film is is pretty darn different and has its own kind of life. Um, some are are sort of, you know, they're never easy, but you know, some some have a kind of obvious core audience that 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 that, that can help you get get a film out into the world. Um, in my experience, those those have been films that have you know more of a kind of an agenda or a, um, <laughs> sometimes an axe to grind. Um, you know, a sense of like the world is broken in this way let's here's 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 how let's go change it and you know sometimes there's like a core group of people like a film i made about about light pollution and it's sometimes the kind of an unexpected group of people like you know did you know there's a coalition of people around the world who are fighting light pollution and they're like part bird watchers and part astronomers and part cancer researchers and anyway and uh, so tapping into that network was was very much its own project and screenings outside in the dark with telescopes and this film you know like still a question we're trying to answer is, mm -hmm. is is does it resonate with other coastal people or is it just <laughs> is it just for Maine um I think most of you know most of our initial screenings have been in and around Maine and I think during the pandemic we're in this interesting space of on the one hand, lamenting the loss of, of public gatherings and screenings, which is sort of how I got into filmmaking and what I maybe love most about sharing the films is that experience of, I mean, the size of the screen doesn't really matter so much as like the, the group of people together watching and wondering what each other is, how, how everybody's reacting and laughing together and thinking and then talking about something. That's, that's, that's something I've really learned to rely on and crave. Anyway, so how do you do that during a pandemic and these kind of gatherings just like this have become a pretty pretty wild and awesome opportunity for, for reaching a, I don't know, I, I think kind of similar size audience that we've reached on, on other films, but just in a very different way. Um, Interesting. So, huh. Was this yeah. your first time working with Robin? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we you think yeah. like that that was one of the reasons why this film um, was different as far as uh, the intent of it. Uh, oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we um, we we had to kind of find a common ground of, of what we both wanted to do and also find a common ground that wasn't like the lowest common denominator milk toast film. You know what I mean? Because that's always a risk in collaborating is you're like, Okay, well, the only thing we can agree on is blah, and it's like, who wants to see blah, you know? So <laughs> we had to find a space that felt cool and interesting to both of us, and then go, uh, and then go there with with, with the film. Um, and there are parts of the film that she, you know, isn't, uh, I'm sure, isn't crazy about, <laughs> um, but uh, but also she, you know, gave gave me the space to, you know, express myself and. Uh, so, um, and, and I think, I think it was you, Lindsay, who, 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 who pointed that out, that that, that is, that is one of those incredibly difficult and semi-magical parts of artistic collaboration. It's like when to, when to push and when to give and how to give space and how to take space, <laughs> you know, um, that's, that's different with every film too. Ian, did you did you have to um, set up a? How did you get your film viewed? Did you set up like an independent screening or partner with another local film festival, or how did you get your film out during these uh, challenging times? Yeah, we we we've done some film festivals. We were lucky. The the film festival here in Camden built a drive-in movie <laughs> movie theater, um, so that was our first showing. It was like outside in October or something, September, and uh, we had people from the film bring, you know, like bring oysters and lobster, e eel chowder and that kind of stuff. And that got a little word of mouth going, you know, folks from organizations around Maine, you know, heard about it. And so they wanted to plan their own screenings. That's been really helpful. Finding a, 
kind of a simple digital platform that can work where it's very easy to people to get the link and you know pay pay five dollars or ten dollars or, or or nothing the organization pays for it that's been pretty helpful too we partnered with the portland museum of art um where we've shown screenings in public in the past and they um Actually, the film's still up there on their website. It's just <laughs> having like a long, like a long theatrical run. I think like one person at this point watches it per week or something. But um, you know, and you imagine like one person in a movie theater per week. They they pull the movie, but in a digital space, like that's okay. It's not hurting to have you know have it live up there. So so that that partnership allowed it to have a kind of a infrastructural platform, and then um, and then we planned a big sort of, uh, I mean, it was like a panel discussion, but um, a guy named Paul Greenberg, who, who's written a bunch of books about uh, fish and seafood, um, sort of uh, moderated this panel. And so it's kind of that, yeah, it's kind of that like relationship building, word of mouth, get the right people invited to that screening who you know are gonna be like, oh, that was cool. I'm gonna go organize my own screening so that they, they build upon each other. Um, activating that core audience of people who are gonna kind of put your film on their back and carry it out into the world. Like that's, that's something we've, uh, we've learned is the sort of the secret sauce. Um, it's, it's funny, I actually, um, I, I wanted to share with, with this group some of the things that we learned in our launch that I didn't know because I had never like, produced a film at any level before. And um, I mentioned that we are co-producers and I say that because yeah, Masari put in a lot of work and they, they you know, they really, um, you know, drove, drove the car on it. So we, and it was about them and about their project and, and their research and um, the project that they did and, and their experiences and in interviewing people. And I think one of the things that we, I wish I would have done and we would have understand what the art, understood what the artists is that if you are an artist or a maker and then you create some sort of mini documentary that promotes yourself, you actually can't be the producer if you want to get um, other people to carry it on their back for them as Ian hmm. was just saying. Interesting. Yeah. So even though we had the um, support of some different media people who were really, you know, excited about what we had done over the summertime. They couldn't show it. They couldn't uh, because it was like created, it was a perspective created by that person about themselves. So it was like too, it wasn't separated enough. And so I just say that in case there's, I mean, because with there's so many amazing tools, like my computer comes with iMovie, like you can do, anybody can do this and except me, I can't do it. Um, but the, but one of the things that we did well, I thought was that, um, you know, we worked with, with our artists and then, um, you know, just like a, I don't know, anybody that would help with, help us with our launch. And we all did it at the same time, at the same minute, we had um, agreed on a length of a, a clip that would fit Instagram, which is, you know, 60 seconds. Um, then we also agreed on the language and how we would tag each other and exactly how we would talk about it. And um, then we gave each other like the tools and, and signed off on everything. It was just really, it was helpful to, like if we couldn't have somebody else launch that had like a really great um, like media presence, then we could do it ourselves and we could do it well and in these ways um, because we all had different networks. So we could try to reach as many people as we could with using free social media, with using our free MailChimp account and our website and just like trying to put things in places and um, make as few clicks as, as you as you can make to try to have people immediately see their your work and click on it with without having to like go deep into web pages or something like that. So um, but um, you know, we use Vimeo, our, our, our movie essentially lives on Vimeo, which we have a free account there too. So it's, there's a lot of ways that you can um, use this medium of archive. And uh, I think video obviously became even more important than ever in this past year. Um, and uh, you know, making things accessible was more important than ever. Uh, so it was, you know, where we realized our flaw, like we should have said, Datma produced the whole thing, you know, maybe we would have gotten more, um, you know, 
we, we would get more of a run out of it. Um, essentially, though, that wasn't the goal. The goal was to talk, have a record of this project and share it and have it in our archive forever. So, but it was, I just think for anybody that might try to do this, it'd be kind of good to know some basics. And then also some free things that you can do. Yeah, yeah, that's fabulous. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add too to Lindsay's point that um, if you're not willing to tell your story, then who is, you know? You don't need to wait for a newspaper or a radio station or TV station to tell your story. Um, because if, if you're that type of business or person or artist or creative that you're just sitting around sending out press releases and no one's responding, um, that you, no one, you got to start taking the initiative to start telling your own story because especially in this area, I don't know what the media landscape is like in, in, in Maine, <laughs> but in, in the South coast of Massachusetts, um, it's very difficult to tell a story. Um, because the, the newspaper is dying here. Um, they've had mass layoffs. They, you know, six years ago, they had 22 reporters. Now they have two, um, you know, they have, and they've got one photographer who they had, you know, six before. So it's, um, they're just like really, really difficult. And you can't rely on TV stations in this area because they only come down for negative stories. Um, you know, even when I'm sure, uh, like even when uh, Dabo was doing their thing, um, you know, PBS came down and did their and did a story, but none of the other stations came out. And I was like, "Why? Why are you not telling these stories?" So, I'm glad that um, DATMA and and these other organizations are taking their own uh, initiative to tell their stories because um, they just can't wait around for someone else to do it. <laughs> so, really kudos, uh, Lindsay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it really. I get you. Yeah, not just the opportunity, but just realizing as a creative, like the agency that you have. And so, yeah, absolutely. Um, which, which would lead me to maybe my last question about where has this project taken you? But I also, um, if we have any questions from the audience, um, uh, we can, we can uh, start with any of those or we can, or let me, hey audience, why don't you think if you have a question in the meantime, where has this project taken you? Where, where, where have you gone as a result of making this film? Or what are you working on now as a result of making this film? <laughs> or just what epiphany did you have as a result of making this film? <laughs> Personal growth included. <laughs> I, I, um, we, we experimented with some new approaches on this film and some of them worked and some of them didn't. Um, and that's, that's, that's been part of the learning process. I had this notion that for the interviews, that they sort of somehow wouldn't be interviews, they would be like testimonials, like complete perfect testimonials. Somehow folks would just speak and deliver a perfect, you know, two minute package story. You know, somehow I was like forgetting that that never happens um, without a script or if it does happen it's because somebody's told that story a million times and they and it just sounds like rehearsed. Yeah. So uh, the experiment wasn't a total failure, though, in the sense that I, th I think what we did gain from that, from trying to do that and have people really speak directly to kind of to the camera and to the audience was I think we, um, most of the interview clips in the film are, are pretty long interrupted, long uninterrupted takes. There's, there's, I think maybe with a few exceptions, hardly any sort of cutaways, um, which is where we traditionally like chop up what people are saying to make them concise or make them say whatever we want them to say <laughs> or whatever. Um, but we just kind of, you know, it became a film where we sort of give people space to talk and 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 hopefully as a result, you know, I, I don't really, can't really know what it's like to experience a film as an audience member, but my hope is that it kind of gives you space to absorb and think and kind of be in the living room with, with, with someone like that. So it's, a, again, so hopefully a little bit of an invitation into a, uh, a different way of receiving and processing information I think we're we're used to so so that was some that was some some growth for me um, finding a way to to give give people s space to speak and to listen uh, some of our projects well we created a lot of friendships and um, so the trust and, and the conversations were totally more than worth it 
Um, I was so happy to see a lot of members from the fishing industry come up and see our films. I was often out there at night being like, is the projector gonna work? <sighs> so I'd like, you know, see the who would be coming and be like, oh my God, people from Providence come here, like crazy. So it was it, a lot of the people that um, came to see our film, I would talk to them and they'd probably want to stop talking to me and watch the film. Um, but I, I created a lot of bonds with um, upcoming uh, public art projects. Some of them, some of them are happening this summer along the waterfront and others um, are just like, hey, we really like how you, how you portrayed the fishing industry. We love the Masari project and we want you to do something on our property. And it's like, oh, great. Like, yeah, give us some more places to put art. Like, so there's um, some projects to come that we're really excited about. Um, and then, and I just, uh, for me uh, doing this project, I mean, I had a ton of learning and I just think that the waterfront and coastal communities just have, like, I respect them even more and um, just I fell in love with them again. And um, it's gonna be hard for me to, next year we have this theme, it's called shelter and, I'm like, oh, we could talk about interiors of boats. Like, I just don't want to stop, and um, but we we have to. Um, so, but it's there's always ways that I'll always want to work with the waterfront and and pay homage to everything that's happening with those amazing, uh, you know, just gods down there on the water. So, but um, so f friendships mostly and uh, reiteration of of um, how powerful that coast is. My takeaways. Also, it's really windy. You cannot put a lot of public art down there. It is, my God. <laughs> Work with the wind, <laughs> as you have. Uh, Drew. Um, yeah, I mean, since making this film, I feel like a lot of doors have opened up, um, producing a lot of more projects um, with, with a, a ton of new people, telling stories I've never really told before, which I'm excited about. Um, but one of the things that really uh, caught my eye was that there was a professor from uh, Boston University who saw my film and um, she teaches um, students from other countries about Massachusetts cities and why if you're a business major like what is that like to work with these and so she she asked me to to um, to be part of this like board and, and give a, a guest lecture to these students and uh, I never thought I'd be you know a person just talking about the city I love and live in uh, based on this film so it was uh, that was a really exciting um, experience and and uh, then then her colleagues at the department want me to do a storytelling workshop with her uh, students I'm like all right let's go <laughs> just all the guests lectures so that was something I never thought would happen from just this film that I, I produced a year ago so that was pretty fun I, uh, I love both of your films wanting a part two yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I saw half of Ian's and I'm just like, man, I would just love to be part of that team. <laughs> just seems like a fun story to tell, for sure. Oh, yeah, I could talk about each interview and the aesthetics all day. Yeah, really great pieces. Yeah, yeah, there's so much we have not talked about related to the aesthetics of your films. Um, you know, we, we might have to do another session, but I, I do, and because they're all amazing, Amazing in their own just own right and, and in such different ways too. Yeah, if you guys want to like project them on the side of a building, I know some people. Hey, there's an idea. <laughs> um, it, it, do we have any questions from the audience? That anybody else want to chime in at this point who would, wants to just ask directly or make a comment directly, even give these filmmakers some great feedback? So um, I'm, I'm from New Bedford for the folks that don't know me, Ian and um, Broto. So um, it was so interesting to me because I've been around New Bedford for, you know, 25 years. And I love Drew's story. We're trying to get him to um, show it at the Z actually this fall if, if he gets permission from the film festival. But um, it's so interesting because it's not the story I would have told. It's not the story of the past 20 years that I would have told. And so um, for me, that is really fun that his voice is new, it's different, it's much younger. Um, and I just love the fact that the story um, of looking back has its own life and its own perspective and its own contour. Um, and so I think that that is really a rich and wonderful, um, for me, that was my rich and wonderful experience. It was not an unfamiliar story, but I wouldn't have told it that way. So that was great. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I haven't seen the other two. I will watch them. I, I have the links. I'm good. <laughs> Great. 
the takeaway from that is tell more stories. <laughs> That's great. Many more voices make for an even richer experience of, of places and communities. Um, I, I think with that, unless we don't have any other last questions, I want to thank all three of you so much for making this work and the work that you all continue to do. Um, and just for inspiring us and, and um, you know, being part of this greater New England creative community. Um, and so that people do know, people who are on the call tonight, and as well as those who will watch this later, this will be posted to the co-creative website as a part of the new co-creative sessions program. So um, Drew, where can people find you? If they don't already know where to find you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so people can find me on my website, um, dfurt, F-U-R-T, um, dot com. You can also find me on Instagram at dfurt arts. Um, you can also find me anywhere in New Bedford. I, I hang out downtown. I go to the zoo. I ride my bike. I, I have a big mustache. You can't miss me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Ian, where can where where should we find Ian? Oh yeah, my, my, um, almost all of my projects are on my film company's website, which is uh, Wicked Delicate Films. It's sort of sort of sounds like a pornography company but <laughs> so you'll be pretty, pretty disappointed when you get there but it's just wick, wickedelicate.com and uh and you can reach me through there too so. awesome and Lindsay, uh well if you come downtown this summer uh you'll see some of our projects along union street it was essentially main street in downtown um, and then otherwise, if it's not, if it's not warm out, um, cause it's either like 4th of July in New England or winter, um, then you'll have to come to our website or social media datma.org or at underscore datma on social medias. But, um, yeah, just, just come downtown and see the work for yourself among the many other arts and culture organizations that, um, are busy and starting to thrive again this summer. So hope to see you there. You'll probably see me there too, like fussing with something, and putting a shim under a kiosk or like having Drew film me do something. So, but That's awesome. It's a special place. This is, um, I, there's something about coastal cities that just have an amazing magic to them. And thanks for acknowledging that tonight, Lori. Yeah, yeah, really amazing. And I think that we've got a, we've got a lot, lot more material to mine about what we can do to support creative communities in coastal cities. Um, obviously, they are just, you know, incredible landscapes of, of inspiration, and I'd say an innovation as well. So um, yeah, let's keep this conversation going. And I will also close and say, um, be on the lookout for the posting for the next co-creative sessions. Uh, program. There will be quite a few coming um, since this is a, a new program that, um, that the creative community is launching and we welcome any feedback.